I think the impact of the qualifiers in uh, the 80 countries where we played has been very positive. So the main message is we need regular home games for the national teams. Adjustments, of course, can happen after sitting down or having had the first cycle and evaluating. And you saw already that uh, for the Continental Cup qualifiers, we'll go from now directly to February, not November. This was one of the adjustments that uh, we felt after receiving the feedback from our federations and our leagues at the same time. Our board uh, took a very clear decision there uh, because that was a, an adjustment that was required for that particular Continental Cup qualifiers. So overall, we're very happy and uh, I think Yes, it could be even better, uh, but let's face it, it is the first time we tried something at the world scale, uh, qualifiers with home and away. Thank you. Right here, gentlemen, with the black polo, please. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Lin from Xinhua News Agency, China. Um, my question is, um, it's the first time that uh, we have as many as 20, uh, 32 teams and eight cities in one uh, FIBA World Cup. So um, what, what is the biggest challenge you have met in the whole process of organiz uh, organization? Thank you. The, the expansion to 32 teams, I think it was uh, a project that came quite naturally having evaluated the, uh, the global nature of our sport and how our sport is uh, developing across all five continents. The eight cities, it's not the first time that we go uh, to many cities. The difference is that we played simultaneously in eight cities and that the teams were moving quite a lot uh, during the tournament. I think the, the transfers of, of the teams were one of the uh, operational challenges, I would say, and it's something that we need definitely to look at after the event, evaluate and uh, apply the necessary adjustments for the next event. This is something definitely that I want to get a very deep debrief, not only from my team, but also from the national teams. Of course, the locals and our team put together the best possible conditions, but still the transfers were, were many, and, uh, and they were part of a very clear strategy to spread sp basketball across all eight cities in this huge country where our sport is so popular. Jan here in green. Thank you. Hello, Jan Casville from French magazine Basket Le Mag. My question was about these transfers. Um, does it seem correct to you um, and for the players' rest when a team travels eight hours a day, then play his quarterfinal, then travels another eight hour trip uh, the day before his semi final? You know, when we designed the competition system, indeed we had to, to find the best possible way of arranging the transfers within a compact time because the tournament cannot take three weeks. We have a certain period during which we have to operate the tournament. Um, I must say that um, after having experienced it, although on paper sometimes it looks perfect, definitely when you apply it, you see the imperfect aspects of it. And these are the things that we are ready to improve in the future, whether that is a few hours of rest more for the athletes, something that we did change during the tournament. We put the dedicated flights, after receiving the feedback from our federations, we pushed them later in the day so that the players could rest in the morning and then take the flight, move, uh, go, set, settle in in their new hotel, and then have their afternoon training session. So we did make some adjustments during the tournament, but I think there is room for more improvement for the next tournament. Gentleman in blue. Peter Steppings from the French news agency AFP. Yes. Um, Andrew Bogart has been in the spotlight quite a lot during this tournament, rightly or wrongly. Um, he had some choice words to make after their defeat, including some quite colourful language, and he appeared to suggest that um, maybe there was favouritism towards the Spanish side. What did you make of those comments he made? And assuming FIBA has chosen not to punish him for them, what, why has that decision been made? 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think, first of all, we need to put uh, the context here. Um, we all understand that our players are participating in a tournament that is, if not the best, one of the best and most important moments of, uh, of their careers, especially playing a semi-final of the World Cup and trying to qualify your team for the first time to the final. And we understand that exiting the field of play, you go through the mix zone, the emotions are very high. And of course, it's part of your job and our job to transmit the message that comes from these players to the fans. So it's not an easy task for them to withhold their emotions when they go through a mix zone. At the same time, we do have a very specific set of regulations, and we do have a specific uh, set of principles and values that we represent, not only as FIBA, but also as sport of basketball. So where these uh, lines are crossed, then we have disciplinary procedure. And in this case, there will be a disciplinary procedure. So I better not comment further on that, because there is an expert uh, disciplinary judge of FIBA that will have to read the documents, ask uh, the player for his position, and then take a decision. Mark Stein here in front. Mark Stein from the New York Times. I'm, I'm sure you're aware that in the States for the last two months we've done nothing but talk about all the NBA players who didn't make this trip for the United States. What was the FIBA reaction to seeing 30-something top NBA players decide that they didn't want to play in this tournament? Um, first of all, you know our role is quite delicate because it's not our job to put together the roster of any of the 32 teams. We need to, to st set the stage, put equal conditions for all the teams, and then each national federation has its own way of approaching the players and um, having them commit to play for the national team. The, uh, there have been, of course, a lot of uh, discussions in the media. We acknowledge that about the, uh, the roster of the US national team, how some players had initially committed and then decided not to, not to participate. Um, I think we should, as FIBA, let, first of all, our member federation, USA Basketball, do its analysis of the situation. And then, of course, we will have a debriefing also with them whether some of the, uh, the conditions that we set for the tournament uh, played a role there. But I have to say that when these players had initially committed, everything was well known uh, from the outset. So we believe it doesn't have to do with, with the tournament itself. Um, of course, every player has certain moment in, in their career when they decide to play in, uh, in a tournament. For some, the timing may not be good, or there may be other parameters that need to be considered. But as I said, for us, it is very important, and we put a lot of emphasis in this tournament, more than any other time, to improve the player's experience. And yes, the transfers between the cities were a challenge, but I visited myself team hotels. I saw the rooms of the players. I saw the players' lounges and everything we tried to put to make their experience uh, an unforgettable one. So then, um, why one federation or another did not have all the players that they would have liked perhaps on their roster, it is perhaps an individual question, not a general question. And, uh, and let's not forget, um, speaking about the NBA years, uh, other national teams besides USA and Canada virtually had uh, all the, the players they had summoned for the World Cup. Tarek Salir, right here in the front. Hi, Tarek Salir from Sport Cal in London. Um, obviously, China was a key growth market for FIBA. How has this tournament helped you to expand your reach here and grow the game here as well? And what legacy do you expect to leave? Well, both the president and I have been repeating a sentence, and I, if you allow me, I will say it again today. Um, we, we have not come to China in order to deliver a great tournament then on the 16th of September, pack our stuff and leave. FIBA is here to stay. And what do I mean with that? I mean the World Cup will have a very concrete legacy. Uh, two days ago we inaugurated the first FIBA Academy, uh, supported by our partner uh, Beijing Enterprises Group. And, uh, this is just the first step in a number of activities. We have a FIBA China office with permanent Chinese staff here in, in Beijing. And of course, uh, Yao and I have had a number of, of discussions on, uh, on programs, both in terms of exchange of know-how with other countries, 
where FIBA, of course, is the facilitator, uh, as well as uh, FIBA programs directly uh, from the headquarters or from our regional office in Beirut or uh, from the FIBA China office directly implemented here. And of course, during this period in the lead of the World Cup, we had the mini World Cup. So uh, I think there uh, we have opened up opportunities, both in terms of grassroots basketball to do things together, as well as uh, helping in uh, systematic coaching of, uh, and teaching of our game uh, in the youth categories. Right here, Mr. Davis. Uh, Josh Davis, the uh, media. Uh, can you just share your thoughts about having teams like Poland and Czech Republic qualify for quarterfinals? And on the flip side, teams like Lithuania and Greece not progressing as far as many would have anticipated? I think the, um, the qualification of uh, Poland and Czech Republic in the quarterfinals is a confirmation of the systematic work that has been done by uh, the federations. They have been working uh, for years in a program. I think they built on the experience of the qualifiers. The chemistry of, the, of these two teams is obvious, I think, on the court, and they deserve uh, to be congratulated for what they managed to do. Um, at the same time, this is also um, a message that national teams uh, require a continuity. National team programs require a continuity. Um, I don't think that it's ever correct to speak um, um, in, a, in a negative or arrogant manner uh, when comparing what we call the traditional nations and the up-and-coming uh, nations. Um, it is, at the end of the day, a confirmation that our sport, not only in Europe, can discover new markets, but it is a little bit complying with the motto we have used at the World's Got Game. We have seen a number of new uh, countries, including those two that you mentioned, playing well. Of course, we have seen others that uh, underperformed. I don't mean the ones you mentioned. Lithuania had a very difficult path uh, to the quarterfinals for a very difficult group. And um, I think every national team and every national federation will do their own debriefing after the World Cup. And uh, many of them we will see also in the Olympic qualification tournaments in, uh, in uh, July next year. Let's move to the other side. Um Janos Miklovas, Basket News LT. It was about uh, 70 referees uh, from EuroLeague and EuroCup which were not invited uh, to referee in World Cup. Do you see it as a problem and is it going to change in the future? I think the referees that have been working this tournament, first of all, it was the uh, first time that we had uh, um, such a big number of, of referees. It's the same uh, group of referees essentially that delivered in an excellent manner, all the qualifiers. We're talking about a huge number of games there and uh, very important games of high level. And uh, the same group delivered also uh, the Eurobasket 217 and the other Continental Cups 217. So um, they prepared in an excellent manner. Uh, FIBA put uh, big investments into their, into their training. And I think this continuity in that group and the way that they have been working together throughout the year, uh, both in the uh, FIBA competitions or FIBA sanctioned competitions for, for clubs as well as in the qualifiers and then in the final tournaments has been uh, very good. Of course, uh, mistakes are part of, of the game and of course sometimes mistakes have uh, consequences that are grave and uh, that is why as you saw in, after one game we had to make a, a public acknowledgement of, of an error and the three referees that uh, unfortunately were involved in that situation, did not uh, officiate any longer in the, in the World Cup. Yeah, right there, Augustus, yeah. Douglas Augustus, there, for Lithuania. Uh, how do you see future of uh, Olympic basketball uh, after uh, in so much investment in, in FIBA World Cup tournament? Well. I guess this is a question that is coming to me in a couple of hours as well since uh, the president of the IOC is expected to arrive uh, after the bronze medal game. I think uh, FIBA is one of the leading uh, international federations uh, within the Olympics. We have uh, not only our traditional disciplined basketball, 
since 1936, but now we go with a second Olympic discipline, uh, three on three, in Tokyo. So um, we uh, are putting a lot of effort in delivering a great tournament together with TOKOG, the Tokyo Organizing Committee for the Olympic Games. And um, I, I think uh, I tried to also pass the message from the FIBA leadership by visiting TOKOG for the test event in Saitama Arena just before we came here to Beijing. It was the last friendlies of Japan men's team and uh, a couple of friendlies of the Japan women's team. So we saw the Saitama Arena. We know the arena, of course. It is the one we used in uh, 2006, an excellent venue. And, uh, and we look forward to having a very exciting Olympic tournament. Right here, gentlemen in blue, yeah. I just want you to, you to ask you if you read some comments made by Georgos Vasilakopoulos and uh, if you want to share with us your relationship with him. Well, uh, Mr. Vasilakopoulos uh, is the president of one uh, of the big federations, the traditional powers, let's say, of, uh, of world basketball in the last 30 years, that is, that is Greece. Uh, he was a former, as you know, FIBA vice president and president of Europe for many years, definitely the most important uh, basketball administrator from, from my country. Um, I often have good discussions with him, plenty of things he uh, has to tell me from a historic perspective because sometimes life and you know, even, even in basketball history repeats itself. I enjoy the discussions with, with him. Uh, of course, uh, I don't have uh, a special relation with any federation, even the one of, of my own uh, country. I have 213 members and uh, 213 uh, kids, one would say, or members that I, I need to take uh, care of and support at any given time. So there is a relationship of respect, I must say, and uh, at the same time from his side, uh, he understands the, the role that I have now in, uh, in my hands and, and the responsibility, and he's always supportive. Right here. Mr. General Secretary, uh, this is probably the only, uh, Antonis Kalgavouras from uh, Gazeta.gr Greece. Uh, this is probably the only final that uh, will be with so less NBA players. Like uh, uh, no current player from the NBA from Argentina and uh, four from Spain but who learned basketball in their own country. Do you think this is the world uh, basketball message? Well, I don't think that just the roster of the two teams playing in the final uh, is, a, giving, is giving us the message that we have a global sport and that there are several countries around the world that develop the game in a good way and then can come to the World Cup and be in a position to win it, uh, whether they have NBA players or not. I think the roster of the semifinals with three countries from, uh, uh, with four uh, countries from three different continents is an indication by itself. Of course, we have uh, a very strong Europe, we know that, and as you saw in the quarterfinals, also some new powers emerging in Europe. Um, I think it is, it is very positive for Australia after the Olympics being again in the top, in the top four. And um, when it comes to the NBA, well, we understand that this is the dream of uh, most, if not all, players around the world. It's the, the top men's league in the world and institutional strategic partner of FIBA, and well, uh, whether you need to have NBAs in your roster to play in, in the World Cup, reach the final and win it, well, in this case, it's not the rule, but uh, one could say it's the exception. I don't think it is for me to uh, discuss the technical side of it. One thing I would like to say is that in this tournament, we saw teams that came very well prepared and with good chemistry go far in the tournament. And this is a message that I take and that I will pass to my federations after the tournament. Because in the same way, we had federations that underperformed because they didn't come in the opinion of the experts, the reports I'm receiving, as well prepared, although they had excellent rosters. So you can imagine that uh, based on the roster of the top 16, we will have some good discussions in, in Asia and Africa in the next months. Uh, do you think it's a successful World Cup for Team China? And uh, uh, what will? Uh, and uh, do you think uh, this World Cup will bring what 
to uh, Chinese basketball. Thank you. Well, the, the beauty of sport and also our sport is whether you win or lose, there are lessons you take. And I think the performance of Team China in this tournament uh, gives certain and clear messages to the leadership of the Chinese, of the China Basketball Association. I'm glad that the man in the top, Yao, is the right person to implement the reform, the changes that are needed. We have here all the ingredients, the popularity of the sport, huge population, um, facilities. You have seen the excellent venues. You have seen cities that are ready to welcome basketball events. So we have all the ingredients to make uh, China uh, a team uh, that belongs to the elite. Of course, there is a certain pathway to follow, and there are certain steps, one after the other, uh, you have to pass. You cannot so easily fast forward this process. So whether in this development process of CBA, the World Cup came in the right moment for them or not, it's also, uh, someone would say, depending on how you evaluate the result. But uh, let's also face it, the result in the second game was a result that depended on one decision on, on the court, one free throw, one pass. So I will not jump into two rushed conclusions just because one game was lost in overtime or not. Um, <clears throat> Enio Tarasi from Lutio Uomo. There are a couple of aspects, organizational aspects, I'm wondering if there are point of evaluation in the future. The first one uh, about the second group phase, because we had a three out of four groups that after game match day one, they already decided their qualified team for the quarterfinals because uh, first from one group and second team from the following group were meeting each other. Perhaps switching the fixture could lead up to a final match around more, um, with more on stake. And the second aspect about the dates to be played to play in the next World Cup, because for example, uh, I think Eurobasket in two years will be played at the end of August the second half of August, if moving uh, earlier the dates of the competition could lead up to a better uh, arrangement with the federations and leagues, especially the NBA, to bring more players to the World Cup. Thank you. For the competition, for yes, for the competition format, I think we will, of course, have a full debrief, but uh, 90 games down, two to go, if I may say now, a first impression is that we're happy with the competition format because we were saying, you know, I had become also, some people told me, you're becoming boring by repeating, in this World Cup, every game matters. So, not only because you play for the Naismith Trophy, you play for direct Olympic tickets. Then, in the second round, you play for the Olympic qualification tournament. And even if you don't make it, you play for your ranking, because it is the ranking points that will give access to the Olympic qualification tournament for the last eight teams. We have no wild card system for that. So every game counted, and this is what we wanted to provide to our fans with this competition system. So carrying the results from the first group to the second group, I think is, is something that we would like to, to keep. Now the dates. The dates, uh, you cannot make anyone happy with one calendar. A calendar needs to include compromises and sacrifices. And uh, it is a very difficult but very interesting balancing process, always. So um, I think there are pros and cons playing earlier or later. Some would say you interrupt the, um, the preparation of the teams or you let, give them more time later on to prepare. There are the commercial considerations as well, it's given the Northern Hemisphere summer uh, holiday period. So I think uh, we will we currently have no plan to change the dates for 23, but uh, uh, of course we need to have a debrief of this World Cup, what I call the first World Cup of the new era, and then take appropriate decisions and take them soon. We will not leave this for the last moment, of course. It's perfect timing to welcome the delegation of the Observer Program, three countries that will organize the World Cup 2023 that just join us. We have time for three more questions. One there. I want to ask you about the Olympic qualifying tournaments and host selection, how it look like and when is the decision to be made? Yes. The, the first step is to, to calculate the world ranking after the World Cup. This will give us the additional eight teams. Um, then 
the 24 teams will receive a circular letter from me with the conditions. Um, the, there will be a hosting fee, which has been decided by the central board uh, according to the commercial value of the, of the event. Four tournaments of six teams, the winner of each tournament qualifies. Um, then we will have um, an evaluation, and then a decision as usually happens at the level of, uh, of the FIBA uh, deciding bodies. Um, I cannot say too much about this now. I would only say on the decision-making process that it will not take that long because we need to prepare, one. And two, uh, the idea would not be that we go with all, turn all four tournaments in one continent. We would like to keep a rule, a principle that is very sensitive both to the IOC and us, which is the universality principle. Vangelis Simon from Greek Public Television. Good afternoon, Andreas. Uh, as we are talking about uh, one of the most uh, famous and popular sports all over the world, I, um, I think all of us will agree that it's a global, uh, global sport, but uh, there are different rules between NBA and FIBA, and that's the problem, in my opinion. And the question is, uh, how far away is the time that we shall have the same ru rules for NBA and for the FIBA uh, uh, events. Thank you. Um, actually, usually, usually in the press conferences or meetings, the, the question on the rules comes much earlier, but uh, thank you for that. Um, we are, of course, very sensitive when it comes to the rules of the game. It's one of our biggest responsibilities. And um, when it comes to trying to uh, streamline the rules between the NBA and the NCAA and and, uh, and the FIBA regulations. Um, the first that we have taken is include them also in the decision-making process for us. So when we study rule changes, we have a representative of the NBA and of the NCAA consulting with us. And this is a very useful exchange because then you don't just look at the rule, you analyze why this rule is there. So um, you have seen that FIBA gradually changed some rules in the last 10 years. Uh, but of course, we need to understand we are a global body. The NBA is a league that if they change a rule, they need to apply it in 30 venues. If we change a rule, we need to apply it in thousands and thousands of venues around the world. And this comes with a great cost. I was uh, sitting uh, uh, two days ago with a president of a national federation attending uh, the semifinals. And as it happens sometimes in the games, uh, a player on the, in the corner, waiting for uh, a closeout situation, and he receives the ball, and he, he pump fakes and tries to make the first step, and steps out of bounds, and it happens a lot. So I turn to the president and say, "That was your player that stepped out of bounds." But last time, I, you know, I, I opened the topic of making uh, the the court bigger. You said, "Well, in my country, we still have schools with the old three-point line, because it costs millions and millions to change the lines." Uh, across the entire world. That is to say, that is not a very simple decision for us. Of course, we monitor that the NCAA is moving some of its rules closer to the FIBA rules. I think that's a positive sign. And uh, at the same time, we also look at how the game develops, because some of the rules need to adjust to how our players play, but some of the rules need to anticipate the change or provoke the change on how we should see our, our game improving in the future. Last question, sorry. Uh, we got. I hope you talk together and you have one good question for you too. I will talk. Aris Barca from Eurohoops. Uh, you have already talked about the calendar. Uh, by all accounts, the FIBA World Cup was a success. And yesterday there was a kind of a peace offering from the Euroleague. Do you intend to reopen a dialogue uh, with the Euroleague in order to close the rift that there is in Europe? Thank you for, for the compliment to the World Cup. Um, you mentioned the word peace. I don't like the, termino the word terminology. I think you've, you've seen it from my side since, since December. I take a very different uh, approach. There, is, there are, of course, disagreements, but we are one basketball family. And uh, at one point, uh, we need to sit down at the same table, approach the topics with good faith, and be all ready to make sacrifices. And what I have repeated, and I said also to the FIBA Congress, two and a half weeks ago, it is a question of strategic alignment. We want to make basketball the most popular sports community in the world. We want to grow the sport. So it, by definition, we're not very 
susceptible to moves that close the sport or uh, close uh, markets. But of course, we need to see uh, and hear from uh, the next months, I guess, from uh, the colleagues in also that very important league, what they think about the future of that league and, uh, and see what are the next steps. Okay, last overtime at the buzzer, Mr. Skuntis. Thank you. It's a uh, Tissot buzzer beater moment <laughs> with Mr. Skuntis. Andreas, uh, taking advantage of the opportunity we have today, I would like to ask you to wish you the best because it's your first public uh, press conference during uh, a major tournament. I would like to ask a trip question. The first one is just one word. First one is any thought to diminish the, the number of the teams or you think that uh, FIBA should go with 32 teams uh, in the future? The other uh, question is uh, taking account on, on the dialogue about the calendar, if there's any thought to give direct qualification to the Olympic Games through the World Cup and cancel the Olympic qualification tournament. And the third one is uh, FIFA did it some years ago. I would like to know if there's any, any thought, any plan or any consideration on upgrading the importance and the meaning of the World Cup against the Olympic tournament. Thank you. And uh, giving the World Cup, I mean giving the World Cup such an importance that might be the major event of the sport. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. On the 32 teams, no, there is no intention to reduce the number of teams. We came with 32. This is uh, a global sport. We need to give the opportunity to everyone to perform at the, at the top stage. And although in the first round we did have some games with big differences, uh, if you allow me, also in the first years that the Dream Team showed up, they were beating everyone by a very high margin. And then a few years later, the rest of the world caught up. And uh, I think we need to give the opportunity to what is today the rest of the world to catch up. And uh, the 32 should not be seen in isolation. The 32 should be seen in conjunction with the 80 that play the qualifiers. And, uh, and these 80 are for us, um, I must say, the focus when it comes to bringing, to making the mid-tier bigger, and of course passing some from the mid-tier to the top tier. Now, the, um, the second, if I'm not wrong, was about the calendar and the Olympic qualifiers. The, um, uh, if you close um, um, the access to the Olympics, uh, and allow it only through the World Cup. Uh, by definition, you allow only these 32 to have a chance to become one of the 11 of the 12, 11 if the host is already in the in the Olympics. I think the opportunity that we're giving now with the additional eight countries allows also those who maybe in the qualifiers had one or two games that didn't work for them. I mean, uh, we had two games in February 2019 were the last shot determined who comes to China. So um, from a developmental perspective, we, in the evaluation we have done so far, didn't consider it proper that these teams lose the dream of going to the Olympics based, of course, on their previous performances and, and the ranking they have obtained. So, the Olympic qualifiers are there and they are there to, to stay. Of course, this coming year they're coming earlier because the Olympics are earlier, which is out of our control. That's why a year ago we sat down with uh, the leagues that are, have 18 teams in Europe and the ones that take much longer. We coordinated with ULEB. We had three workshops. The leagues came, they put down their calendars, they said, this is how we would like to do it. We would like uh, three, four additional days that we would have to take them away from the preparation of the national teams. Can you do that? And then we went to the board, we talked with our federations, and it's not easy because the preparation period for the Olympic qualifier is short. But we said we need to respect our clubs and our leagues, and we shortened the preparation time for the Olympic qualification so that the leagues can have a proper finish uh, to, their, uh, to their season. Now, the third point on the relations between the World Cup or the Olympics. You said whether we're thinking on upgrading the World Cup against the Olympics. 
I would copy this sentence but stop as follows. I would say, yes, we continue upgrading the World Cup period, not against the Olympics. The Olympics are uh, a great, the greatest sporting event in the world. The Olympic basketball tournament has given to us some of the greatest moments in the uh, basketball history, in the history of FIBA. IOC is a very important and strategic partner of ours. Our relationships are excellent. And uh, we're very happy to welcome tonight President Bach to be with us uh, for the final of, of the World Cup.